Okay. Good morning. We can now see some people entering uh, entering our virtual meeting. It's like people are getting morning, chairs. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Hey, uh, members, if you would help us out, I, we kind of like to know where you're from. If you just kind of go into the chat and just jot down uh, what your hometown is and maybe what the weather is like there today, we we kind of appreciate that while you uh, enter the room. There we go. Boston's in the house. Newport, Rhode Island. Whoa, it's happening very fast here. Chicago, South Bend, Nashville. I saw you there, my hometown. What's the weather like in Nashville, Jim? It's very nice today. I want to ride my bike this afternoon. Hey, Klaus, I need some help here, and I'm hoping these people can help me out. Would you go to Would you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. Look, I live in Nashville kind of like the middle of Tennessee. And these two guys walked up on my porch, my porch this morning. Now I kind of live out in the country. I don't live in Nashville proper. I'm used to having deer and that type of thing come through the yard, but I've never seen these before. They were quite loud. My wife would like to know what they are. I have no idea. Somebody said, hey, oh, I thought I saw something come up. I missed it. It happened that fast. So if you know what these are, these are turkey vultures? I don't okay. think so. I don't think so. Guinea, Guinea, Guinea hens, uh, several uh, guesses okay, here. Okay, we got several of those. We got several of those. Uh, they're not turkeys. I know we, we have turkeys come in all the time, but I have not seen these guys before. And to be honest with you, they were really loud. It was right at dawn, and I get up that early. And uh, it was pretty annoying. I think uh, Guinea no, hens. They're not is, cows. Uh, Terry, I saw that. I got cows. You know, my neighbors got cows. I know what cows look like. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very good. Klaus, why don't we, why don't we get started and we'll, uh, we'll go to the next, the next slide and, and get them uh, and get them going. Just a few rules because there's going to be a lot of people here today and I, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, the, out, the number of people that, uh, that attend this meeting and attended the last meeting just kind of blew us away. But because there's so many people, you may have noticed that we have disabled your audio and video, but you can talk back and forth in the chat uh, all you want, and we'd like you, you know, like you to do that. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. We've got somebody monitoring the Q&A. We're going to try to answer every question that comes up, and if we have time during the session, we'll try to We'll try to answer them live, but if we don't answer them live, uh, what we'll do is we're sending out the, uh, sending out a response later, or we'll answer them uh, answer them in uh, in text. Uh, the meeting is recorded. You may have noticed when we started the meeting, uh, something came out and said we are recording the meeting. The recording is going to be available. We usually get it out. If we don't get it out tomorrow, being Friday, it'll be the first of next week. We'll have the recording available. It'll be out on the hub, and we will send it to everybody who uh, also has uh, responded to the uh, uh, to the invitation. Well, the next one. Okay. If you weren't on our last meeting, let's just let me just take a moment to explain what the newbie group is about. It's a it's a group that we we put together for people who are relatively new to Tableau and just everybody who wants to improve or enhance their, their Tableau uh, experience and their, and their skills. It's a place, it's your meeting. It's a place where you can come and meet with other people who are at about the same skill level as yourself. And to that point, sometime during the meeting, if you sit there and say, hey, I would really like these guys to go into and some topic and talk about and talk about this. Just put it in the chat because we're looking for uh, ideas for future meetings. What you'd like, to, what you'd like us to talk about, or what you'd like, what you'd like our guest speakers to talk about. And we will have a guest speaker every uh, every time. Also, meetings are about six to eight weeks apart. Now the next meeting we've already planned. The next meeting it's going to be May twenty sixth. We moved it. It's a little longer than uh, than the usual time span because of the conference. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Tableau Conference is going to be live this year in Las Vegas. That's May 17th through 19th. And starting next week, March 15th, you'll be able to register for that conference. So you want to mark that on your calendar. May, May 17th through 19th 
is the live conference in Las Vegas. You can sign up for it next week. In every one of our meetings, we're going to have two sessions. One, it's going to be a how does that work session, and that's Klaus and I. And we're going to we're going to kind of take a deep dive into some of the things that Tableau does, help you understand a little bit better how how Tableau works. And then we're going to have a featured speaker every uh, every session also. And this week we are so so proud to have Steve Wexler with us. And uh, for those who don't know Steve, Steve is is one of the uh, He's one of the founding fathers. He's he's been around uh, been around for quite a while, and he is a Tableau Hall of Fame. And I got to say this right now, visionary. And you can hear Zen Master when you hear that. But he is a uh, he is a Hall of Fame Tableau visionary. And Klaus and I are both visionaries also at uh, at this point. Let's take a quick look at the agenda for this uh, this week coming up. We're going to spend about ten minutes. To, Talking to you about the uh, talking about the overall program, and we've got some new people to introduce, some people who have joined our team also. Then Klaus and I are going to spend about twenty minutes talking about how does that work. In this session, we're going to talk about the mentions and measures, blue pills and green pills, and what they do and how they differ from one another. And then Steve's going to talk to us about why do we see so many bar charts? What he's going to help us understand is there's better ways of doing things than just looking at bars and pies. And then we're going to have some fun time and you'll have an opportunity to win a uh, e-learning license for, uh, for a year. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. And hi, everyone. Also from my side, um, great to have so many of you today here with us. Uh, for the second episode of our Tableau Newbie user group. And like Jim already said, we are really excited that we could quite extend uh, the team uh, compared to last time. Um, when you've attended last time, you might remember this fancy map I, I created last time. Um, and um, yeah, drawing on that, the, the, the new additions to our team are here today with us. Um, and yeah, we, we, um, we could quite, uh, quite extend um, our reach and we are so happy to have Laura with us from Chicago, in it from Indianapolis. We have Viraj from, from Mumbai and we also have Forrest from, from Lagos, from Nigeria. Um, yeah, that will who will all join us uh, leading this user group, and they will be around the Q and A section in the chat, um, and will will help us uh, preparing and uh, conducting these these meetings. And yeah, maybe we we do just a little uh, introduction round, um, and everyone will briefly introduce themselves. Maybe where where you're from, where you're working at, and most of all, since this is the Tableau newbie user group. For how long have you been using Tableau? Where are you on your Tableau journey right now? Laura, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I can um, start off. Um, so I'm from Chicago, just like um, Klaus mentioned. Um, I actually work at a law firm as a BI and data analyst. Um, another thing, um, I actually did my master's in business um, analytics, and that's how I um, came into this position and it's a pretty niche position because it's in a law firm so the way I use data is quite different from what I what um, other financial firms or other um, what, what I say like variety of like tableau dashboards look like um, I am still very kind of new to um, tableau so it's been barely around like six or seven months since I um, started using tableau regularly so I'm still kind of in the, my dashboard building phase and trying to make everything like look good so yeah Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for joining us, Laura. Enid, do you want to go on? Yeah, so my name is Enid Burchett. I work for the University of Indianapolis. Um, I am the director of data analytics for them. Um, so the way I got started into data analytics was I did my MBA in finance and data analytics, and that kind of opened the world of Tableau for me. Um, I've been using Tableau for about a year. And I thought I was doing really good until I started looking at some webinars and I saw all the fancy things that people do with Tableau. And I was like, oh man, I have a lot to learn. Um, but I'm very excited, very excited to get started and um, helping the team out with, with anything. 
Thank you, Enid, for joining us. Viraj, do you want to go on? Hey, hi, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Tableau Newbie user group. And my name is Viraj. I'm from Mumbai, India. I'm a lead analyst at Ugama Merkel Company. You know, it's a leading analytics and technology services company. And, uh, you know, I've been working with Tableau for last, you know, three to four years. But I think since the pandemic, I kind of picked up the momentum and started learning a lot more, practicing and now use Tableau for, you know, many personalized projects of my own. Hope to build a wonderful profile like, you know, Jim and Claus have. So looking forward to it. <laughs> also, Thank Viraj, thanks for joining us. Um, and we have Horace. Um, Horace, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Horace, uh, based in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I've been using Tableau for about uh, a year and a half now, or about two years. Um, I work as a business development specialist for a technology company in Nigeria. And um, I got into Tableau uh, because of my keen interest in analyzing data at work. Um, so started trying my hands on a number of tools and I sort of, um, you know, like, you know, just the, the visualization and, you know, the way data has been um, analyzed using Tableau and, you know, that, that, you know, caught up my interest. And that's why I've been trying to work on a number of personal projects using Tableau for the last couple of months and decided to join this group. And I hope to learn a lot more um, while you know, working with this group going forward. Amazing, thank you, Horace. Um, thanks for joining us and everyone again. Um, yeah, um, I would say we will now start with our first um, point for today. But before I do that, I will, uh, I will show it every time I show this map. This map is very easily to create in Tableau. Um, so there is a super cool function called make line. And with make line, you can just uh, connect geometries build with make point and get these nice arcs. And so you just have to try that out. Um, super, e super easy to create actually. Okay, good. Um, yeah, Jim and I want to talk today about in our second episode of how does that work? We want to talk about dimensions and measures. Um, for all of you who have attended last, uh, last, the last meeting uh, where we talked about connecting to data, we, we modified data connections, we were creating joints and unions and relationships. And this topic today is kind of the natural next thing to talk about because um, after we have connected to data, Tableau will classify our data into dimensions and measures. Um, and about this dimensions and measure thing, uh, Jim will talk about in a few minutes in particular. Um, and before I pass it over to Jim, I want to talk about uh, the right data structure first. Um, because that is often a problem. Um, so we see these questions a lot in the forums. Um, I, I don't get it to work. Um, I can't use totals. Why doesn't that work? Um, and that's often because the data structure isn't what it, uh, what it should be. And, and that's what I wanna talk about a little bit. I will show a little demo in Tableau Prep, um, how to reshape your data when it has a certain structure. And that will be the first part that I am happy to take over. Yeah, what, what kind of data structure do we need to, to work with in Tableau? And I'm leaning here um, towards uh, Hadley Wickham, the famous R person you probably know from, from Twitter. Um, and he defined what tidy data looks like. And tidy data is what, what I would, we always recommend to have in Tableau as well. And in, in tidy data, we have one, one column for every variable. Then we have the observations of these variables that form the rows and the combination of variables and observations that make up the table. So the, um, the observational unit, that is what, what a table looks like. And especially when, when coming from an Excel world, uh, you might sometimes think or often think, I have well-shaped data, but 
sadly, most of the time or very often you haven't. And this is what, what Wickham would call messy data. And our strong recommendation is to fix it first because only with, with a kind of tidy data, uh, you are able to use the full capabilities of, of Tableau. So what can go wrong? And I'm, I'm, I'm showing maybe the most common problems um, based on, on four little examples. Um, let's take a look at this first table. And in this table, we have column headers that are values and not variable names. Yeah, you see these uh, seems to be uh, income groups less than 10,000, 10 to 20,000. Uh, so these, these column headers are actually values of our variable income group. Um, and what would happen if we would connect this table to Tableau is that we would have a measure for each column. And, and this is nothing that we want to have. And, and therefore we have to reshape the data. Uh, the second example is kind of similar. We, we again have column headers that are values um, and not variable names. But in this case, we have even two variables are stored in our column headers. So there is uh, 0, 14, 15, 24. This seems like H group, H groups. And we have uh, M, and if we would scroll further to the right, that would be F, that would be D, that would be whatever. And these are abbreviations for the sex. Um, again, um, we have values in our column headers and not variable names. So we have to reshape that um, table as well. Third example, um, kind of strange uh, setup of a table. I mean, we, I think we, we've all seen strange tables already uh, in the wild, but in this one, we have variable names. Uh, look at this fourth column, temperature maximum, temperature minimum. So we have the variable names in rows instead of our column headers. Um, and again, we have here values. This seems to be days. So again, values of a date variable stored in our column headers. And the fourth common, uh, common problem with tables that is we have one type in multiple tables. So it seems here like we have our monthly superstore sales uh, stored in separate tables. Um, and according to the third uh, point here from, from Wickham, we want that to be in one table and have the, the date uh, that is uh, here part of the table name, we wanted to have it as a separate variable in our table. Okay, so um, what can we do to, to fix this? Um, so since I've mentioned, we recommend to fix it first. Um, I've made up four cases with dummy data for these four problems. First problem, column headers are values and not variable names. Um, look at this um, data. We have uh, subcategories and we have four columns uh, where we have quarterly sales or profits or whatever. And here's the same problem. These column headers are values of the date variable and they are not variable names. And easy thing to do, uh, we need a pivot step, uh, grab the four columns, pivot them, then the values will be this um, variable and these val values are our date. And if it's a date, I would always recommend to make it actually a date. And this way we have reshaped the, the table and we have now three columns, one for every variable in our data set. Well, so I, uh, I have to admit, I have never seen that done before where you just change a string to a date using that wait, function. Wait, wait for it. It it, it, it gets even better. Um, yeah. So that's a very, very, um, very cool feature actually of Tableau Prep. Um, let's have a look at the second uh, second uh, case. Multiple variables stored in one column. Look at the column headers. Uh, there seems to be again uh, the the date information. And this time we have all, also a regional information, central, east, south, west. And here it starts repeating central, east, south, west. So first thing again would be to pivot this data set. We have four quarters for four region. We have 16 columns. 
grab these 16 columns. Um, this is now our value. And in this one, we have the date and we have the region. And I'll take this column, the date region column in a separate step and split it up. I will do a custom split and define the dash as, as the separator. Then I wanna have all columns that uh, have to be split off. And this will create my date column and my region column. column. We can get rid of this one. And again, make this one a date. And we have our four columns like uh, we wanted to. Third case, uh, this uh, strange table, uh, try to mimic that as well. Um, and look here again in my fourth column, there seem to sit variable names. We have quantity here, we have sales here, and then it repeats. That seems for every, uh, for, for every case here, there is the quantity and the sales. And like in the example, I have days at, uh, as my column headers for these columns. Um, so these are again values and not variable names. Um, this is kind of uh, repeating. And um, so I'm pivoting my, my days. Oh, I have to get rid of this zoom um, control. Pivot this one. And this will be the value. And the value is now actually can be quantity or can be sales. And this is the day, right? Okay, now um, the day should be not a string, but a number. And in the next step, I will use, um, I will use the make date function to make it actually a date. I'm using the year, the month, and the day. And then we have a date and we can get rid of these columns of the day, the year, the month column. Um, we have lots of null values. I will exclude them as well. And then we're almost there, uh, we, but we still have variable names in rows. We would need another pivot step, but this time we will switch rows to columns um, and use the measure variable that pivot that will pivot the rows to columns and the quantity or sales uh, variable that will be aggregated for the new columns. Yeah, and, and that's it. We have sales, we have quantity, we have date, we have a customer. Yeah, that was the third problem. Then the fourth uh, we have, um, that was we have uh, the same data in separate tables. So in this case, uh, we have subcategory profit and sales. Um, and what I wanna show you is um, how to use the wildcard union in the input step. Um, so I'm going to the input step and let's see if there are multiple files in the folder where my, my initial table sits. Um, and therefore I define a matching pattern. So I'm looking if for more tables or more files that include superstore and sales. And then Tableau will look for it. Um, and they Tableau should find three tables. Yeah, we have superstore sales for August, September and October. I will apply that and you will see some new columns here popping up. So there also seems to be some kind of uh, labeling uh, mess with sales and revenue that should be the same. We have the table names and the file path. So let's fix that. Um, I'll take the sales variable and the revenue. I assume these are the same, the same and I will just merge them. I don't need the table names. Uh, I can remove that column. And now my favorite trick, uh, you see the, the, um, the date sits within the file name. And I'm just switching this to a date and Tableau Prep is smart enough to realize that this is a date. So um, 
I've I've created tiny data for you, Jim, um, and uh, yeah, you you can take it over now and see how uh, and explain how Tableau is making dimensions and measures out of it. Okay, we're going to switch screens here. I was monitoring the uh, uh, the chat a little bit, and people are just going crazy for uh, prep and some of the things you've done. So. Uh, I think we're going to have to have a session on prep at some point in the future. We'll have a speaker. Now, we've got uh, we've got the data tidy and everything's uh, everything been loaded into uh, into Tableau. And you open up your Tableau workbook, and it's going to look something like this. You could have multiple tables, and each table is going to be listed separately. And if you look at each table, you'll notice there's a line in each table, and I'm trying to show it here. There's a line that separates the dimensions from the measures. And we talk about blue pills and green pills. And as we uh, look at the uh, dimensions, you can see the blue icon or the blue, uh, the blue pill show up. And as we get down to the green, uh, the measure area, uh, they look like uh, green pills. Now, I'm sorry. I'm going to put uh, category up here on uh, category up here on rows, and it's a dimension. And as a dimension, it works just like your header does in Excel. The dimensions are used to categorize data, or group data, or, or put uh, common data together. It's it's like putting a tag on a variable that you can come back and you can look at later, and you can group them all together. Uh, the dimensions create blue pills. Those blue pills are usually discrete, and I can access any individual item in that header and change its position on the uh, on the header. And if I bring a measure to columns, we get an entirely different response. First of all, you see it's a green pill, okay? And you think about measures, think about think about uh, green pills. I'm going to put some values on here so we can see what the values are, okay? And Measures create axes where dimensions create headers. And if I bring another measure on, it'll create a, a separate axis. So every time I bring a measure to the canvas, it creates its own axis. And we talk about aggregation. Well, the default aggregation is, is some. You can aggregate these in any way you want. Some or average or a variety of different measures, but the default is sum. And if we take a look down here at the bottom of the uh, at the bottom of the grid here, we can see that we have three marks. Those are the three there: office supplies, furniture, and technology. And the total value of all of these is is uh, two point three million dollars. Now I like to also open up the analysis frame and look over here at this data view because this gives me two pictures that I, that I really like to look at. The summary view is the visual picture. It's what, it's what you see when you look at, the, uh, look at the chart. And we've got those three rows, just like you see there, technology, furniture, furniture and supplies, and then the total value. And that total value comes from aggregating the detailed data that's there for this work, worksheet or the sub, subset of the total data. We talk about the data table or the underlying data. This is the underlying data for the uh, Superstore data set. It's 10,000 rows. Well, those 10,000 rows have been aggregated to these three values. Now, I can also open that, and now we have 17 rows. Those 17 rows represent the 17 subcategories. I'm just going to make it a little cleaner to look at it this way. So I've got 17 rows, but we haven't changed the total value. It's still the same total. It's $2.3 million. And if I come out here and open that view again, I see 17 rows worth of data. And now we see what those individual values are. So this is where we start talking about independent variables and dependent variables. Our sales or our measures are, are the dependent variables. And the value that you see in each one of those cells or in each one of these bars depends upon the value in the 
independent variables or the categories are the independent variables. So for office supplies and fasteners, it's about uh, $3,000. So we can see that uh, our dimensions create blue pills and they create headers. Our measures are aggregated as they uh, come to the viz and they create axes. But there's sometimes when we have data that may look like a measure, but we really want it to act like a dimension. And then we could take discounts and put it up here. And that number really doesn't mean anything. We'd rather have that green pill be a blue pill and act as a dimension. And there's two ways to make that happen. We can open this up. I'm just going to right click this. And we can convert it to a dimension or, and convert it to discrete, or we could just simply pick it up and relocate it into the uh, dimensions area. And when we did that, it's no longer a green pill, it's, it's become a blue pill. And when we bring it to rows, we can see there's now 17, or I'm sorry, there's 12 marks that represents the 12 different buckets or categories of uh, discount. Now I can bring sales against that and it will create an axis for, and I wanna put some values on here. And we can see that $1.1 million of that $2.3 million in sales were done at no discount and uh, $50,000 or $54,000 were do, done at a discount of 0.1. And we could also bring profit. And we could see, oh, I've got two axes now. And if I wanted to see when profit turned negative, anything over 0.3 discount ended up with a negative profit. Probably not a real good business decision there. Okay. But once again, what we've done is we've, we've taken what was a measure and converted it into a uh, dimension. Now, we mentioned some uh, that sometimes you have a dimension that acts as a discrete blue value, and you're probably most familiar with doing something like this, where we've got a date that we've uh, expanded out to quarters, and then we can bring sales up against that. And, and we'll get a chart that looks like this. We've got sales by year, by quarter, but it's separated into the, into the four years. And, and we see an awful lot of questions where people come up and they say, hey, I'd like this to be a continuous chart. And there's the key word, continuous. I'd like this to be a continuous chart so that I can see sales from the beginning period, the first quarter of 18, all the way through to, uh, the last quarter of 21. Well, how might that be done? Well, I'm going to right click as I bring the order date to columns. And a window is going to open up. And this window is going to allow me to select the level or the 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 uh, the date part that we'd like to see, and at some later date, we're going to go over date functions. Now, the top part of this window, these are all discrete uh, date parts, like month of date or quarter date, which we were just looking at. And the bottom part are all green, and I know that's a little difficult to see, particularly for these old eyes. But these are all in green, and these are the continuous parts. And I'd like to look at quarter. And now when we bring sales, we get a continuous chart. It starts at the first, uh, the first quarter of 18 and runs through the fourth quarter of 21. And it's a, it's a continuous chart. And we can bring to that a trend line. And we can see we get one trend line that uh, is the trend for the entire four-year period. If we were to go back here, bring in a trend line, which we can do. We get a trend line for each individual year, okay? But this uh, this is the idea of we've got one dimension here that represents order date, and we've looked at it two different ways. We've looked at it as discrete values, and we've looked at it as a continuous value. Now, there's one other thing that we can do here that's kind of fun to do, and this is one of those wild things that I, I think Klaus showed me that uh, similar to what he did in prep. where we can look at this discrete chart, okay? And I've got, and because I can access each part of this axis individually, because they're discrete, 
we can change the order of these things, or, or we might want to look and we say, oh, well, 2020, that was a, that was a COVID year. It really doesn't represent too much. I don't want, I don't want it in the data and we can just exclude it. Or we might decide that we want to take some values and move them like November and December. We want them at the beginning of our chart and not at the end of the chart. And you'll notice by dragging and dropping, we can just relocate them whenever we want them. We drag and drop in one uh, in one year, and it affects all uh, all four years. But the discrete chart will allow uh, the discrete nature of those uh, values will allow us to do that. Klaus, that's what I wanted to cover. Off. Do you want to perfect stop where we've been? Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Sure. Yeah, and I will try to wrap it up. With this one. So um, thank you, Jim. Um, and yeah, Jim and I would try to, to, to put everything that we talked uh, about, or particularly the part that Jim talk, um, talked about, in a meaningful way. And uh, let me try to, to assemble that step by step. So Jim talked about pills. Um, and when, when Tableau, when we connect our data with Tableau, um, Tableau will classify the data into dimensions and measures. In the, in the data pane, we have this divider line. Above the divider line, we have the dimensions. Below the divider line, we have the measures. Um, and like Jim showed perfectly, the dimensions are the independent variable in our views. Most of the time, they contain qualitative, categorical information. They define the level of detail in the view, the number of rows, the, the number of marks in the view, and they will add context to a measure. To a measure. Yeah? Remember, we had this $2.3 million, and the more, um, the more dimensions uh, Jim brought in, the more context we added to this measure. Then we have the measures, the dependent variables, most of the time quantitative numeric values. We, we, we can use measures in a different way as well, but that's maybe uh, for one for another um, session. Measure, measures will be aggregated by default when you drag them into the view um, and they will be aggregated over the dimensions or the level of detail in the view. Then we have the color. We have blue pills and green pills, and blue pills are discrete variables, continuous green pills are continuous variables. Um, and what you can, what, what, what I always um, um, think about when, when seeing these green and blue pills is that blue pills create headers and continuous green pills create axes. Um, so th these are the components um, and in our views, we can put these components together however we want and however we need. Uh, for example, um, in this first uh, quadrant at the top left, um, there are examples for, for discrete dimensions. So a table um, normally has only discrete dimensions on rows and, and columns and uh, a measure on label, um, for example. Um, here we have a, the, the red arrow is pointing to the continuous dimension. Uh, Jim had showed it as well. Uh, a date is normally a continuous or often a continuous dimension. Uh, we have the continuous measures. Um, so everything uh, that we drag on from, from the measures area into the view will be aggregated by default and create an axis. Um, and there are rare occasions where we also might have discrete measures, um, but that's maybe um, kind of exotic one, but it's also possible. Yeah, um, so these, these two word pairs, uh, dimensions and measures, discrete and continuous can be combined however you need it in the view. Um, yeah, and this is what we thought could be useful for you, especially when, when starting with Tableau, because we all know this, this can be confusing and it just needs some, some experience and practice to get through this. Um, and this might be one step on your journey to, uh, to, 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 to fully understand what this is about. Jim, do you wanna add anything? 
I think we've pretty much covered this one, Klaus. We've, we've got to, we've got it pretty much there. Are there any questions that have come up that need to be answered? Uh, I know we have somebody monitoring the question and answer. Maybe just okay. Sorry, Viraj. Yeah. So this is one question. While uh, while you're working on the Tableau prep, it, he was uh, Michael was asking, will these actions be taken each time the data is refreshed in the data prep? The changes that you were doing. Um. Yes, th that's possible. So you can you can put Tableau prep flows on a schedule. Um, Unfortunately, uh, you would need the, the um, data management add-on, but there are also ways of autom optimizing the table prep flows from the command line. Um, and I can share a link in, uh, in the Q&A section or maybe, maybe just point the question to the Q&A section and I will uh, share a link uh, where you can learn how to optimize uh, table prep flows as well. Sure, and probably we'll just take one more uh, question is, uh, Russ was asking, can you change strings to the date after a data source has been published or only as it sets up? You, sh you should be able to do it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see a reason why not. You, no, it should, should be possible. Yeah, that, so, uh, that should not that should not be a problem. Okay, cool. We're, I, I I think somewhere along the way we're going to do a session on dates and date functions, and uh, there are a number of functions that would allow you to do that. I'm thinking of uh, I'm thinking of make date and, and date, but there are a number of functions that would allow you to do that. Oh, there are so great functions: uh, date yeah. trunk, uh, date path. Yeah. Uh, yes. That would be amazing. And yeah. date, it's and worth a session date, on its own. Right, and date has been one of, is one of the uh, you know topic that many have, have suggested that we should be covering sure. it. Yeah. Okay. 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 I hope everybody enjoyed that. I think uh, I think we're ready to move on. Okay. Okay. We are fortunate today, and uh, we have a session in, in each one of these sessions. We have a special guest. Well, we are fortunate today, and if we can go to the next slide, Klaus, uh, Steve Wexler is going to be with us, and, and Steve is, uh, um, yes, he's a Hall of Fame visionary, uh, formerly known as a Zen master, yeah, but, but Steve is... Uh, He's sort of the, he's sort of the Zen master that Zen masters go to when they have, uh, have questions. He's the founder of uh, Data Revelations, but he's also the author of the um, just recently released uh, the Big Picture and how to use data visualization to make better decisions faster. But I think most of us that got started with Tableau know Steve from the work that he did to co-author the big book, book of dashboards, which is sort of like the Bible that's sitting on everybody's shelf. So uh, it's a real honor to have Steve with us today. Steve, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, and uh, you have the next uh, the next session on your own. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm always interested when um, you see the, gee, we need to aggrandize the guests. So they're not just guests, they're special guests. And I hope maybe <laughs> if I try very, very hard, maybe a year or two from now, I'll be a very special guest. We do exactly the same thing with, with, with chart chat. In any case, um, I'm delighted to be with you here today. And after that incredibly useful and insightful uh, combined presentation from Klaus and Jim. I'm going to go kind of low tech and get into more conceptual aspects of data visualization. So with that, let me share my screen. And I'm going to discuss why do we see so many bar charts? And hold on. Let me just move some windows around here so I'm not distracted. There we go. And I show some variation of this 
can't use the word variant, some variation of this slide in virtually every presentation I give, and that is you are encouraged to disagree with me. Good things happen when we debate and discuss things visualization. So at the end, whatever you think, hey, I don't think that's right, or I think there's a better way to show this, by all means, pipe in. All right, question. If you wouldn't mind in, ch in the chat window, who thinks bar charts are boring? If you think a bar chart is boring, go ahead and type that into chat. Wow, I'm seeing lots of people saying yes. Oh, I'm seeing some, it depends. Okay, all right. So I'm going to chastise all of you who have said that it is boring and say, it's not the bar chart, it's your data that's boring. And in my head, I kind of hear this comedian, Lewis Black, he has anger issues. But realize there's a reason why you get funneled into creating bar charts, and it has nothing to do with boring or not being boring. All right, here is our infamous superstore sales data, and I'm showing the 17 different product subcategories. If you let Tableau do what it wants to do, if you just double click subcategory and double click sales, it is gonna make something like this. Although you'll probably wanna sort it from highest to lowest. And then somehow you've got in your head, well, that's really boring. I need something that's eye-catching, that's really gonna grab people's attention. So it's, it is alluring, it is begging you to click it in the upper right corner, especially as you first start this, but you discover the show me button and you start playing a little bit and go, oh, wow, I've just made something incredibly cool. Look how, how cool this thing is. Show me is just fantastic. No doubt about it. The item on the right is more visually arresting than the item on the left. You're gonna go, wow, look at that. But can you answer any questions about your data? Quickly, what's second highest? What's third lowest? How much bigger is phones than accessories? You're not gonna be able to do it with the pack bubbles. And the reason for this is you are humans and humans are innately fantastic at judging the length of bars from a common baseline. And you stick at comparing the area of circles. And I'm gonna ask you to do this for me. I'd like you to go to bigpick.me front slash estimate if someone could type that into chat for me, so it's an easy URL, I'd like you to try this. If, by the way, it's using Google Forms, and if your IT department has banned you from being able to access it, just do it in your head. But go to bigpick.me front slash estimate. And if F is 100, how big is G? And if A is 100, how big is C? Okay, so there's the URL. Let's see how you do. I'll give you about 20 seconds. I don't want you spending a long time on this. Just try to gauge the size of the circle, the area of the circle, and the length of the bar. Oh, don't type it into chat. Don't give it away. Come on. Keep that to yourself, naughty people. I should have said that initially. Don't give it away in chat. And who knows whether you're right. There we go. No, just keep, Adam, no worries. Just keep it to yourself for a minute. All right. Let's see what the results are. So this is as of earlier this morning, before any of you did this. I have been running this thing for the last year or two with my um, big book of dashboards colleagues and look at the massive difference, okay? Of these almost 4,500 people, only 39% got the size of the circle right. Almost twice as many got the bar correct. As tellingly, take a look at the guesses that are a little too low or too high. You don't have guesses all over the place, but look at the bars. Guesses, a lot of people underestimating, a lot of people overestimating. 
you know what? Let's see how this group did. Let me re, so we had 4,455. Let me refresh this. Hopefully this will sometime, okay. Oh, okay, that's nice. We're up to 4,625. Let's just look at responses from today, 173. Thank you. This is my point. You are bad at um, estimating the area of circles. You are fantastic at judging the length of bars. And we ask which was harder, which was easier. Yeah, circles are way, way harder. So this is the result sometime last year. So I can't help but think of this quote from Andy Kirk, who wrote the book Data Visualization. What is data visualization? It's the representation and presentation of data that exploits our visual presentation abilities in order to amplify cognition. This is a wonderfully erudite and articulate way of saying good data visualization takes advantage of what people do well and avoids things that we do poorly. And just to drive this home, this freaks me out. Professor Matthew Kay showed this at a, a conference maybe four years ago. The smaller circle is 50% of the bigger circle. You can imagine how many times I've seen this and presented this. I can't see it that way. It looks like it's 75%. It looks like it's three quarters as big. It's half. That is half as big. Now, that the takeaway shouldn't be bar is good, circles bad. Circles can be great. They're just not good for making accurate comparisons. For example, circles here are very, very helpful. Curious, does anybody know what this is a map of? And don't be a wise, you know, Weisenheimer and type the United States, yes, it's the 48 contiguous states. But what am I trying to show here? Number one answer from people is usually population because people see the big blob for California and they know, well, a lot of people live in California. But if you look at some of the other things, oh, Oregon and Washington wouldn't be that big and Texas wouldn't be that small. Uh, capitals, wildfires, rain, oh, these are GDP, produce. Oh, oh food production. Population, it's not, po yeah, the, the, so it's not population or electoral college, but some of the other guesses are amazing. By the way, over the number of years I've shown this, my favorite guess is um, recreational use of marijuana, but then Colorado would be larger. All right, Tableau users. Oh, you, you're, this is fun. Boy, am I gonna be disappointed. The bottom line is, I don't know what this is a map of. I made it seven, eight years ago. I forgot to put a title on it. But it's still useful because whatever it is about, way more of it is happening over here than is happening over here. And that's useful to know. But if I need the exact measurements, maybe I would pair the map with a bar chart as well, because the bars allow really accurate, quick comparisons. All right. So that was a little bit about why we see so many bar charts. But something you may end up fighting within your own organizations. And that is the people who just love to see numbers and only love to see spreadsheets. And we need to get them to recognize why just the numbers isn't good enough. So this is a composite of every client, stakeholder, partner, colleague I've had in the last 16 years who just doesn't yet buy into the value and the, the transformative power of a good data visualization. Essentially, they're saying, you can have my spreadsheet when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. And I, the, the most saddest thing somebody can ask you when you create a dashboard is, can you put a button on there that'll allow me to download this as a C, CSV file? But it, it's well-meaning, but they just haven't yet they're not yet comfortable or confident in their ability to read and interpret charts. So let's see how we can help them. And one of my favorite ways to do this is with the highlight table. And as um, 
my co-authors in the big book of dashboards and I call it the gateway drug to data visualization. So here's a cross tab or a spreadsheet. Okay, now you can type into the chat window. Tell me what combination of product subcategory and region. So this is, this is 17 different product subcategories, four different regions, there are 68 cells. Which combination is the most profitable and which is the least profitable? So is it paper in the West? Is it chair and chair mats in the South? What is the most is, woo, we've got some fast people here. So not the overall. In any case, this typically takes people about 20 seconds to give me what the highest value is and the lowest value is, and roughly 15 to 20% get it wrong. It takes a long time and people get it wrong. By the way, here are the correct answers. Tables in the East is the least profitable and office machines in the South are the most profitable. Let me show you something we can do that make it that it's gonna take three seconds and everybody's gonna get it right. Let's color code the cells. In Tableau, this is called a highlight table. It's not a heat map. It's, um, uh, heat map is a different animal. Um, the highlight table is color coded and you have those numbers that people so desperately want in there. And even if you can't see the numbers, I can see, well, that's an extreme value and that's an extreme value. And there's a bunch of other things. Binders and accessories is doing really well. Tables in general is doing really poorly. And your stakeholders, your spreadsheet lovers will probably like this a lot because they love the numbers, but you just made it way easier to find what's important in the data. And another time we will have a discussion of why am I using those colors? Why am I using blue and orange? Why am why am I not using the what you would think would be universally green and red? But we'll discuss that elsewhere. All right, let's take this one step further. By the way, that should say tech support calls, not tech support calls. Sorry about that. As everybody now can't help but look at the typo that's at the title. So this is showing hour of day and day of week. The concentration of technical support calls. And it's pretty easy to see when we're getting a lot of calls and when we're getting few calls. Just look for the dark orange, correct? All right, I'm gonna ask the, the, kill, the, the question that I see a bunch of people anticipating, which is what time of the day do we get the most support calls? And what day of the week do we get the most? When do we get the fewest? And anytime I have a highlight table, I think it's an opportunity to augment it and enhance it with a marginal histogram. Margin meaning around the sides and the histogram is just showing the distribution of values in each area. And now it is super easy to see, oh boy, just look for the biggest bar and the smallest bar. Super fast to be able to see when, and, and the, those of you who guessed 12 p.m. bravo, but had I asked you which day was the most, oh, that's a little harder, and that's Wednesday. Now, if you're saying, well, couldn't you have just put totals on the end? Yeah, but now you're going through the whole thing of having to scan through every number. Is this the biggest number? Is that the biggest number? And think, well, well, why not just color code them? Well, the minute I color code them, by the way, because those numbers are so much bigger, I lose the the color coding that's in the center of the table. But even if we could figure that out, even if we just had that, if somehow we had color coding that worked for the lower values and for the totals, let me just focus in on 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. And let's just look at the color coding. I can tell that 11 a.m., there are about twice as many calls at 10 a.m. And how, how do I know that? Well, in my head, I can see 1376 is about twice as big as 672. Great test for how potent your data visualizations are. Take the numbers out and can people still understand this? If I take the number out, come on. Can you tell me that 11 a.m. is twice as orange as 10 a.m.? No, but now let's do with the bar chart. Take the numbers out. And I can absolutely see that that's twice as big. Here's a quote 
I'll tell you who it's from in a while. We can say that one shade is darker than another, that is obvious, but to say that it's two or three times as dark is not visible. It is not readable, and that comes from Charles Menard, the guy who made this chart in 1869, and at some point in your journey in data visualization, someone is going to expose you to this chart, and I have a um, very different opinion people have on this chart, but I love that quote. All right, getting back to the first question, why do we see so many bar charts? I don't know if, if any of you have seen this movie. It's an Eddie Murphy movie from 2019. And it's called Dolomite is My Name. And Eddie Murphy plays a, a stand-up comedian who makes um, comedy albums. And he supports the sales of the albums by touring and playing one night stands and nightclubs. And he goes, boy, this is a grueling way to make a living. I know what I want to do. I'm going to make a movie. So here's the setup to this. Rudy Ray Moore decides to finance his own movie. His, and how does he finance it? Advance royalties from his record albums. And the record company, and they're pretty sympathetic, said, look, we'll give you the advance royalties, but if this doesn't work out, you are, um, you're gonna owe us for, you know, for the rest of your life. He makes the movie, but no studio will distribute it. Moore rents a movie theater for a single late night show. The show sells out, but then nothing happens. There's no distributor. Cut to the next scene. By the way, this movie took uh, the takes place in the mid seventies. We see the office of a sleazy movie producer or studio head, and he's reading the trade magazine Variety. He opens up to a page, and he sees a table full of numbers. He's astounded to see a certain number, and it's associated with this movie that that he had turned down. He looks up and says in astonishment, what the F at the F? Gets a big laugh. All right, can you see anything that's amazing in this data? It takes a lot of work. And, and by the way, this is how I see the world. I'm going, oh my gosh, they're missing an opportunity to make something that's important clear. You know, I want to yell at the movie theater. So you have to work really hard, but suppose they had done this. Come on, you can't help but see one of those bars is way larger than the rest. And if you are doing a curated presentation, maybe you will use the pre-attentive attribute of color to make the thing stand out. Oh, and maybe you'll use an annotation layer, which you probably wouldn't have to do. In any case, had it been a bar chart, everyone would have seen it. There would have been a bidding war on the movie except one producer who managed to look really hard. So the bottom line is, why do we see so many bar charts? Because it gets us to what the F at the F so much faster. And a huge part of what your job is, is to uh, um, time to insight, see things that people wouldn't have seen before and reduce it. And what are the things that are in your arsenal? As a data visualization practitioner, the way you get people to notice things are things called pre-attentive attributes. This is a fancy term for things you notice without even noticing that you've noticed them. Now, without even thinking, I can go, hey, that one's longer, that one's wider. Hey, that's bigger. That's a different shape. That one's tilted. Hey, that one's a different color. You get the idea. And in terms of making accurate comparisons, hey, I can see that's twice as big. That's four times as big. Oh, that's just a little bit bigger. Nothing trumps length or position, that position or length from a common baseline. And that's why we so, see so many of these things, because it's allowing people to make accurate comparisons quickly. One last thing that I'll say is it doesn't necessarily have to be a bar chart. If you get pushed back because they're heavy and they're boring, I will show you two alternatives that work just as well in terms of people being able to make the accurate comparison. You can make a dot plot and that little guiding line there that I like so much that was pr proposed by William Cleveland, who did all this research with McGill back in 1983 to determine what it is that people do well. So you could do make one of these or make a hybrid dot plot and bar chart. It is called a lollipop chart. 
but do not dismiss bar charts because you think they're boring. They are, you better have a good reason not to use length from a common baseline. And I'm just arming you um, with some alternatives to this. If you're curious about this, this is, if you can follow me on Twitter, that's my email address. And everything in this presentation, including a full discussion of the Mon Menard chart and why I think you should not make anything like it, you can go to bigpick.me. You can learn about the book and you can also download a free sampler of it. So uh, hopefully you'll think maybe a little more highly of the bar chart because boy, it's a potent way to help your audience see and understand the data. And I'll leave that up for another second or two. And I'll stop sharing. And I'm, by the way, I'm focusing on the presentation. I have no idea what's been uh, happening in the Q&A or the other stuff that's been going on in chat. So if there are questions Steve, that people want me to answer. They're, Steve, they're only saying very nice things about you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also your links have been put in the chat, so they're available to everybody. Thanks so much. Uh, probably just one question, Steve. You know, Monica says, you know, thank you for helping us understand more on the bar charts. In talking bar charts, I see visuals with stack bar. What are the thoughts on these? Um, oh, you know what? This is, I'm, 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 let me see if how if I can dig this up quickly. Um, give me one second. I've got I'm, because it only take a minute, and I think I can put my hands on it really quickly. I think I can. No promises. Uh, but the stack bars have its place, but it's a very particular use case. Uh, da, da, da. can I find this quickly? Yes. Quickly, Steve, you're losing the audience. They're getting bored. Almost there. Here we go. You share the screen. Boy, this better be worth it after all that, don't you think? <laughs> Hold on one yeah, sec. Yeah, it should, Steve. <laughs> yeah, this better, this better be great. Man, the way, you know, holding everything up, this better be just phenomenal stuff. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Yes, yeah, we can. All right, so here is the stack bar chart. And I can see overall south is bigger than west, is bigger than central, is bigger than east, correct? But now I want to focus on the, uh, the, the categories that I'm responsible for, my stuff. Can you tell me which of those bars is longest and which is shortest? Probably not. But if I change the order of these things, yes. change what's along the baseline, bam, I can see those things uh, 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 come out. So if you've got a, a stacked bar chart, the only thing that you can compare is the overall and whatever's along the baseline. So a great thing you can do in Tableau is determine what's the thing that gets the baseline. And I could get into this in a, to a you know, greater degree and things that will allow you to dynamically move these things around. But that's, that's the problem with the stack bar chart is that they're, 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 it will only give you overall and then whatever is along the baseline, which by the way, and this is a huge conceptual leap, it's exactly the same thing with a pie chart. Pie chart is a part to whole, and you can only really tell how big that one slice is that starts at midnight. So a stacked bar chart is just a cubist pie chart. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure, and sorry for sorry for you know having to dig into that, but I'm glad you asked about it because it's it's. Um, it, can be a great source of, I can't make any sense out of this thing because it's all these colorful elements that are stacked on top of each other. So I think we're ready. Okay. All right, folks, thanks so much. Steve, thank, thank you. you. That was great. Thank, thank you, Steve, that was an amazing presentation as always. Oh.
Uh, absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me here today. Okay. Um, yeah, and we will move over to our last part. And this will actually be the fun part. I mean, everything was kind of fun so far, I hope. Uh, but especially this part um, will be will be something where everyone uh, will be able to contribute. Um, and we will do, let me bring that up. We will do the Tableau escape room. And we are talking a lot about how to do things in Tableau. And with this um, escape room challenge, we are kind of flipping the, the setting. Um, and the, the Tableau escape room is one of the most successful Tableau public visualization when it comes to views and, and favorites. And in this escape room, you or um, someone you want to do it can, can practice how to interact with a dashboard. And we found one volunteer, and this will be Viraj um, from our team. Um, Viraj, if you don't mind, uh, would you share your screen? Um, Viraj will, will take this challenge and um, yeah, try to escape from the Tableau escape room. Um, and I will put the link to the, to the escape room in the chat. Um, so there is a, oh, the link is already in the chat. Um, and we we have uh, a Tableau e-learning license. So the first person who completes all the questions and has all the passwords and drops it in the chat will receive a Tableau e-learning license. And while you're doing that, Viraj and I will will also try to find our way through through this escape room. Viraj, do you want to start? Uh, yes, so, yep. Let's again get into room number one. Okay, um, maybe just briefly, so we see a dashboard um, with, uh, in this case, a map, some nice KPIs, there are filters, and you see questions on the right side. And the task is to answer these questions by interacting with the dashboard. Um, so the first question, Viraj, is what is the total sales for the West region in 2017? So yeah, mm -hmm. I'll just select the region, then the years 2017. So the total sales is 259,000. Yes, we have the answer. So the next question yeah. is... Yeah, what is the average discount of Illinois for 2015? Okay, this is the challenge itself to find Illinois on the map, but we will, <laughs> we will, we will do it. Yes, we'll do it. Uh, uh, I would say more to the right. Pardon my just... In the middle, yeah. the yep. right one, this one, yeah. So the answer is 43.19. Yeah. Third question, what was the average discount for the technology technology category in Washington for 2018? So very top left. Yes. yes. Yeah, so we have this this and tooltip breaking down the total average to the categories. Yeah. And the last one, what is the total profit for the East region for all years? 125. 125.507. Okay, and you have the first uh, solution, helpful. Okay, okay let's, go, so... let's go to the next room. So the setting is a little bit different. We, we again have these nice uh, big numbers and then some bar charts, a line chart, uh, a map that will be used as a filter probably. There's a filter at the top for years. And again, there are four questions. Um, in 2015, Viraj, what were the binary sales for the West region? So, 
So the binder sales was fourteen zero six zero. Yep. Sounds good. Then next one. What was the highest sales total for accessories for a given month, all years, company wide? Okay, so here are lots of actions in place that filter down the view, and this should do it for the accessories. Okay, then 2018, what did the bottom five subcategories based on sales contribute to profit? Oh, that's a tricky one. Yes, and I hope I'm selecting the five, yep. bottom five, yes. Yep. And contribute to profit, it's 5975. Yep. Perfect. And the last one, Northeast region during 2016. Um, how many subcategories were not profitable? Okay. Yes. And now we can count one, two, three, and four. Yeah. The red good highlight of, really helps. Yeah. Good use of color here. I wanted to say the yes. same. Yep. In, interactive is the second word. Um, cool. Do we already have someone uh, completing all the dashboards? No, seems not the case. Okay, then the third one, room three. Um, so we have a nice bullet chart comparing sales, 2018 sales to the sales target. So the this little lines are the targets and the bars are the sales. And color again is here indicating if the um, if the if the target was met or not. First of all, with a sales target of twenty five percent, how many subcategories are missing their target? So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Mm -hmm. So seven subcategories are not doing well <laughs> yeah. with the target of 25%. Okay, let's narrow that down to the central region. Central uh, region. Oh, oh, that's a lot of red. <laughs> yeah. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I hope, yes, we have eleven yeah. in the option. Okay, now wow. let's be even more uh, more detailed. Uh, we move to the east uh, and uh, adjust the parameter to 15%. Uh, what is the difference between the actual and target for furnishings? Difference. Oh, the tooltip gives you the, helps you in this case. Mm -hmm. It's 1015. Okay, and then we look at fastness, 10% uh, sales target. Uh, what is the difference across all regions? Oh, it's quite last of $71. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Viraj, we have... we're almost there. Yes. Inform informative. Informative. No, informative. informative. So let's see what's behind the door number four. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So again, a couple of bar charts, map as a selector to filter down regions, some KPIs, and again for questions. 2016, what was the percent of returns of furniture in the West region? Furniture. But in the West region. Yeah. So Viraj seems to filter with uh, with hitting control, right? Uh, to select yes. multiple items. Yes. Yes. Okay. What was the? Uh, okay, you already have the answer. Yep. Perfect. Uh, then 2018. What state 
was ranked first in returns of technology in the home office segment. I'm sorry, my mouse is acting a bit weird. Sorry. Let me yeah, select 2018. Mm -hmm. You're still on furniture? Yes. Yep. Yes. In which state was ranked first in returns for technology? In the home office. That's California. Mm. Okay, 2017, what was the percentage of returns for New Hampshire when combining furniture and office supply returns? I'm really glad mm -hmm. we don't have to find New Hampshire on the map. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. yeah, we may have a winner out here, guys. Uh, Olivia? Oh. I saw something come up in the chat. Are you telling us that you have completed the challenge? Keep, keep going. We'll wait for Olivia to respond here. Yeah. Viraj, do you already have the solution? So we are looking for combining combined furniture and office supply returns in New Hampshire. Okay, we're beginning to get we're beginning to get uh, more and more responses that people have finished. Jason's yeah. finished. So we, we have one more que question. Yeah. So what was the percentage of table returns in the South region in 2015? Wow. This one South is tricky. Region. Yeah, and we have to look in the to the there's a tool tip. It's 9.8. So we have the, the last password. Well done, Viraj. Now let's see uh, if, if you can escape. Let's go back to the home screen. The first one was helpful. The next was interact informative and data and uh, the drum roll yes hey. escaped Bravo, it was fun it was <laughs> fun <laughs> thank <laughs> you for thank you for volunteering that's great Hey, uh, I'm looking through the chat. Olivia has said, yes, she did finish when I noted that. I did not see anybody prior to Olivia. Uh, Enid or Laura, did you see anybody prior to Olivia finish? You can unmute yourself and just let us know. Yeah. I think we can yeah. have a look at the chat. I just, Talk yeah, I just went up and I saw that. Um, LJ yeah. mentioned first yeah. that it was helpful in interacting with informative data. So I think that's the, that's the num like the words, the keywords. So yeah. You think so Olivia is LJ. the one? Yeah. So before Olivia, LJ, I believe. He okay. had all the um, um, escape words, the passwords. And what time, what's the timestamp on that one? Uh, let me see. Um, oh, that was uh, 12, uh, 20 and Olivia, it was like a minute difference, I think. Yeah, so LJ messaged John twelve twenty. same with uh, someone named Regina Turner. LJ and Regina Turner messaged at the same time, 12, 20. And Olivia had twelve twenty one. we had a twelve twenty. Whoever the twelve twenty is, please direct message uh, either myself or Alyssa your uh, email contact so that we can get you that certificate for the free learning. So we do have a winner. LJ is our winner. Congratulations. And really strong recommendation if you if you have users that are not familiar with using this kind of dashboards, 
just uh, send them a link um, and they can they can train a little bit with that and uh, i think it's really helpful and uh, a cool cool thing to to start just learning how to interact with dashboards yeah jim i think we are almost through it right i think we are i think we are we just uh, and, and i want to thank everybody i had a lot of fun today i hope everybody else did thanks steve Steve, you're great as usual. If if you are new to Tableau or if you're at any level of Tableau uh, and you don't follow Steve, please follow him. If you're doing anything with statistical data or you're trying to reduce statistical data, Steve is the expert. He is the go-to on anything to do with data and surveys and the like. He uh, He's the man to go to. Now, we have the next meeting already scheduled for May 26th. And that's uh, right after the convention. It'll be at the same time. I have these times listed as PSTs or as uh, standard times. I know daylight savings kicking in at different points in time. And we're gonna, we're gonna have to make sure that I've got the daylight times and the standard times uh, listed right. But it's gonna be at the same time it was, we're gonna uh, go off, but I'm not sure what local time that's gonna be because of the daylight savings time. Uh, the link where you can register is already out there, and uh, I believe it's been posted in the chat on a couple of a uh, couple of occasions. Or you could go out to the uh, to the uh, Tableau User Group Hub, look under Newbie User Group, and the May link is out there. You can sign up now, and of course we'll have uh, uh, we'll have uh, invitations sent out later. And once again, if you have something you'd really like us to talk about, and I saw some topics come up, if you have something you'd really like us to talk about, you can either drop it in the chat now or you can send it directly to Klaus or myself, uh, you know, via the hub. So thank you very much. I thought it was a good meeting. Klaus, you have anything else? Yeah. Um, same for me. I really enjoyed this meeting. Um, thank you, Steve, for, for your great presentation. Viraj for, for doing the, the escape room challenge. There's lots of positive feedback on, on the uh, in the chat. Yeah, I'm already looking forward to the next meeting in May. Um, I hope for everyone that you will be able to attend conference. Um, there, is a, there is the in-person conference, but there will also be a virtual conference. Um, so everyone that is able to make it to Vegas, uh, lots of learning opportunities um, in the virtual, virtual conference as well. Um, yeah, and it uh, would be great to see you there somewhere. There will be a Slack channel uh, where we can where we can chat and meet. Reach out to me. Reach out to Jim. Uh, we're happy to take your 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 questions. And yeah, looking forward to the next meeting. And to to that point, I plan to be in Las Vegas. So if you're there, look me up. Love to meet you. Okay. See you next time. Bye bye. Right. Bye now. Bye-bye.